Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, GPAR. This is Matt Braden from the GPAR team. Hope everybody is doing well on this Friday morning. Um, hopefully you've been paying attention to some of the emails that have been coming from the association over the last uh, couple of days, in particular, the one that was sent out yesterday um, regarding restrictions, COVID-19 restrictions and the city of Philadelphia. Um, some new measures took effect today. Um, that does not impact the work that uh, our folks do, uh, but it's very important to be mindful of what the guidance is and to adhere to it. As we have seen in other industries, um, following the guidance from uh, local municipalities and health, health departments has not necessarily been followed and it has caused problems and has led to, to restrictions um, or outright shutdowns. So it's very important to go ahead and make sure that you guys are doing the right thing, uh, both for your safety, the clients, your client's safety, as well as for the health of your business. So um, hopefully you guys will check that out. Um, Monday morning, fast forwarding, we're gonna kick the week off with Coffee Talk. We're gonna have PAR President Bill Festa join us with President Stephanie Biello. And we hope that you will join us too. So nine o'clock, we'll find out about what's going on with the State Association, um, and all the things that are going on there. And uh, obviously they interact a whole lot with what happens as it relates to COVID-19 and the state of Pennsylvania and the guidance. So um, lots of stuff to get uh, from that conversation. Bill Festa, he's one of our members. So we're very fortunate to have Bill join us next week. Um, and then with that, we're done with our, our housekeeping effort here on my end. We're now going to hand it over to our guest presenter, and that is Trent Pettis. Uh, if you've heard me talk about Trent before, we're very fond of Trent. He's a great contributor to our association. He makes himself available on a lot of different levels. Um, and one of the things I think he enjoys the most is, is helping people out. Either you're a seasoned, grizzled veteran or you're a newbie. Um, he likes helping everybody out and to be better, but also to the style in which he goes ahead and does the, the presentation. It's interactive. He wants to hear you guys. He wants to see your faces. He wants you to engage. Um, it's not just about him talking for two hours. It's about you guys being participants in this uh, as much as you would like. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Trent. But before I do that, I dropped into the chat a link to the forms that we'll be working off of today. So uh, if, you, if you need access to it, just click on that link that I dropped in the chat. All right. Good morning, Trent. Good morning, Matt. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. Good morning, everyone. And good you morning. heard Matt. If possible, good morning. Good morning. If you all can, good morning. Those who can put the videos up. I would love you to. If you can, it's okay. But I love the way to see people and not this big black screen on this TV. So if you can, good morning, Todd. Uh, so I appreciate it. If you can, if you can't, we understand. Some of you don't want to be seen, but I love it. Thank you all who. Um, and I do, and Matt also said, I do want this to be interactive. I mean, I like that. I love teaching and I love being in the classroom. That's the one thing I miss. I'm sitting in my office in the conference room, looking at this big screen TV. It's just not the same. So I like the way to see people, but I do want you to stop me. If you have questions, you don't have to wait to the end. We can make this, this is interactive. I love to do interactive type workshops. Um, but I do want to spend most of the time or the predominant predominantly on this listing contract. And now when you go, when and I see some, some seasoned agents here, most of the time when you go over a listing contract, you're not gonna go over every paragraph. You're just gonna go over the, 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 the meat of the listing contract. Today, I wanna basically try to go through the, you know, like every paragraph. I wanna go through as much of it as possible, especially for newer agents who've never had to do a listing contract. And even some older agents or seasoned agents who've done listing contract for years, but they really never kind of paid attention to paragraph X or paragraph Y. So I wanna go through as much of it as possible. Stop me with questions. Um, and um, first of all, since I'm looking at some of you, how many of you have never written up a listing contract? Just raise your hand so I can just get an idea. You've never listed ones with licenses. I know, so um, never written. Uh, let's see. All right. And most of you have, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, I just wanted to see. All right. So let's just kind of get started. Um, 
the first now matt said the listing contract is in chat you do want to be looking at the listing contract because i want to go through so many of the paragraphs so you probably need to go on chat and get this or you can just go on zoom uh i mean i'm not zoom on um, zip forms and pull up the the listing contract exclusive right to sell listing contract because uh, you really want to have that in front of you uh as we go through this all right so if you if you don't, how many of you can't see it? I mean, uh, does everybody have access to it? Do you either see it in, in um, chat room or just pull it up on zip forms if you can? So I'm gonna pull it up on zip form right now. All right, um, any questions about anything before we get started? Anybody have any questions, comments? Well, wow. all right, let's talk about the listen contract. Um, now, if you uh, now here's one of the things that I want you to do, especially newer agents. So before you even get to the listing contract, the first thing you want to do is make sure seller calls you and says, or potential seller calls and says, "Hey, I want to sell my property." Um, the first thing you want to do is pull up the public records. Go to City. Uh, you know, we can access it through Bright. Pull up the public records and see who the owner is. Because let's say a John Smith calls you. And the person who's telling you, um, I want to sell my house is Susan Johnson. So you need to know who Susan Johnson is because John Smith, I don't know what I, name I just said, John Smith is the owner in public records. So you need to say to her, wait, who's John Smith? And she may say to you, oh, that was my father. He died. I'm his only heir. So you do want to check that. Sometimes you'll get a seller who is not the legal owner or one of the legal owners and does not have the authority to sell that property. So one of the things that people say, one of the things are when you, the number one, and this is this a common sense kind of thing, you don't want to get to someone's house and public records has one name and there's a different person. You're like, okay, I don't have any idea who you are or how you can sell this property. You know, there's, you're not an heir. You, you're telling me, you, you know, just do that first because before you even get there, you should be asking questions. Uh, how, how do you own the property? Who, who exactly are you? If they tell you, for instance, I am the I am the uh, executor of my mother's estate, or the administrator of my mother's estate. One, an executor means someone died with a will, correct? If they died without a will, then they would be an administrator. So make sure you know the difference. If someone's saying I'm the executor or executrix of an estate, that means someone died with a will, a will appoints the executor or the executrix. If they die without a will, then someone would be appointed the administrator of that estate and they would get what we call letters of administration. So you want to know, and most times what I've found is that people will use those words interchangeably and oftentimes incorrectly. They may say, I'm the executor of my mother's estate. And I would say, hey, let me see the will. And they say, oh, she died without a will. So instead of asking whether you're the executor, or administrator, and if they use those terms, simply ask, did your mother die with a will or without a will? If she died with a will, then there's going to be an executor. If she died without a will, then there's going to be an administrator. So you, you can cut through all that because oftentimes people will use it incorrectly. Did she die with a will? Did she die without a will? If she died with a will, you want to copy the will because the will is going to say who that property goes to. And you need to have, and if the will is going to say who the executor or the executrix is. So the person sitting before you has to be the executor or the executrix, and they have to go to probate and get what they call letters of testamentary. So you that that actually appoints them as the executor or names them as the executor or the executrix of that estate. So if they die with the will, you want a copy of the will and you want the letters of testamentary showing that they've been they've been named executor or the executrix of that estate. If they say I died, my mother died without a will, then you need letters of administration. That means that person went to probate and was appointed the letter, was appointed the administrator or the administratrix, depending on whether the man or woman, the administrator of that person's estate. So just kind of start there. Um, any questions about that? Any comments? You all got that? Everybody understands that? All right, so we, all right, so let's, so let's just start. We started there. So now before you even get there, you now know that the person who I'm going to see is the person who is, can legally sell this piece of property. All right, um, and we're only dealing with the, uh, the exclusive right to sell contract. 
if you all remember from your real estate class, there are actually three uh, listing contracts or listing agreements. One is exclusive right to sell. That's the only one that we deal with. Well, that's, you can deal with, you can use any one you want, but par in the par library, they don't have the other two. Exclusive right to sell con listing contract, the one we're going to deal with today, and more likely your broker is probably using this one. Exclusive right to sell contract says uh, the seller hires one office, one company, one brokerage to sell his or her property. And no matter who brings forth the buyer, that brokerage earns a commission. One broker, one company is hired to sell your property. Even if the seller finds a buyer, one of her coworkers decides to buy the property, your company still earns a commission. That's the exclusive right to sell. That's the only one my company uses and probably most brokerages. All right, so that's exclusive right to sell. There's also the exclusive agency listing. The difference between exclusive right to sell and exclusive agent listing is agency listings that exclusive agency listing that seller hires one company, one brokerage, but if that seller finds a buyer on his or her own, then that broker does not earn a commission. That's the difference. Uh, exclusive agency listing, one company is hired, but if that seller finds a buyer on his or her own, then the commission is not earned by the broker. And then you have what they call a non-exclusive listing or an open listing where the seller can hire as many brokerages or as companies as he or she wants. And whichever company brings forth the buyer, that's the company that earns the commission. But if the seller brings forth her own buyer, then no one earns the commission. All right. So I, I so the only one I would ever use, the one I've only ever used is exclusive right to sell. So when you go to uh, the PAR, the uh, Pennsylvania Association of Realtors Library, Forms Library, you will only find the exclusive right to sell and not the other two. So if you go to a seller and the seller says, hey, I want to be able to sell it myself, then go to your broker because they probably will have to draft or have a, so maybe the attorney draft an exclusive agency listing if your broker is willing to take that kind of listen, I would not. All right, any questions? I'm just trying to do some background. Any questions, comments? Someone has a comment. Someone has to have a question. Come on. Everyone got this? Am I boring y'all already? Can someone say something? Am I boring you now? Yes? No. All right. Any, no questions, no comments? All right, does can, can everybody see the listen contract? The exclusive right to sell listen contract. Does everyone see that? Because I want to kind of start going over that. Does everyone have that? Yes. All right, let's look at it. exclusive right to sell listing contract. That's the only one that you're probably going to use. That's the only one that I would use. That's the only one you'll find when you go into uh, uh, the uh, uh, PAR uh, forms library. Let's give it, let's take a look at the uh, broker. That's the company. Sometimes and you say they put company in parentheses, but sometimes agents will write that broker. Remember broker. Broker can be the brokerage, the company. Broker can be the broker record, the person in charge of all the agents. So broker is a company. Uh, who does a listing contract belong to? If you sign a listing contract today and you quit tomorrow, who does that listing contract belong to? Broker. To the broker. So it's, you work under the broker, under the company. So if you sign a listing contract today and you quit tomorrow, you not permitted to take that listing contract with you unless the broker allows you to, all right? Broke company, uh, 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 I'm sorry, listing contract belong to the broker, the company. You Obviously you will put down the company address, you will know that, the phone number, fax number, licensee, your name. One of the things I would say to you, if there are multiple agents involved in the sale of this property, put all their names, just don't put one person. If there are two of you, there's a co-listing agent, put that co-listing agent on the listing contract because that person should be listed because they are technically one of the listing agents on this contract and they should be able to get credit for it at some point if they're trying to get a license, a broker's license. More than one agent, put all the agents, you put the direct number, your cell number, fax, email, pretty standard. Seller, make sure uh, you put all the seller's names Sometimes broke, uh, agents will put their three or four sellers. They may put one or two. Every seller has to sign this contract. Otherwise, it is no good. If you had three of the four sellers sign this contract, this contract is not valid because all four, every owner has to sell, be signed this uh, listing contract. So make sure you know all the sellers. 
Uh, make sure you know all their names, the names are cor uh, spelled correctly, list all the sellers, have all the sellers signed. If again, if you had an estate, let's say you did have someone who died, just put a state of blank, the state of Mary Washington, the state of John Smith. You can just put this state off and then you would have, if it was, a, if it was a, if the person died with a will, you would have the executor sign the listing contract. If the person died without a will, you would have the administrator sign the listing contract. All right. So all the sellers, sellers mailing address, make sure you put a mailing address uh, because sometimes uh, you may have to get in touch with a seller after the after the uh, the uh, property is sold and you don't have a foreign address. So you want to make sure you get an address for the seller. All right. Get an address. Put that address there. They may not they may not even live in the property. Put the address where where your company, your broker can still get in touch with the seller if he or she ever needed to. Put that phone number, email, fax. Uh, number uh, line 13 says seller understands that this listing contract is between the buyer and the seller. I mean, the broker and the seller. Again, I just mentioned that this contract does not belong to you. You just listed a $2 million property, but you decided to quit on Thanksgiving morning. Well, that listing stays with that company, unless that broker is nice enough to say, take this $2 million listing with you. But uh, I kind of doubt it. All right, so make sure you understand this listing is not yours, it is the company's listing. All right, does a seller have a listing contract for this property with another broker? Well, if you have an exclusive right to sell contract, how many, how many brokers can that seller have? If you have an exclusive right to sell, how many contracts, how many, how many companies can they hire to sell the property? One, one. Only one. So if they have another contract, with another agency, you need to stop and say, whoa, and you need to ask, well, wait, why, what kind of contract do you have? Maybe they have an open listing. So you, you can't have an open listing and exclusive right to sell. So if they have another contract, you need to figure out what's going on. Maybe they have a contract that expires at the end of this month and they want you to start selling it as of December 1. That's possible because they can still get you to sign a contract that starts at a later date. So if they say, hey, I have a contract right now, but it expires the 30th of December, the 30th of November. And I and because if the property's not sold, I'm not going to rehire my my agent. So I want to, I want to hire Carolyn to sell my property as of December 1. All right. So then you would understand why they already have another uh, um, broker. And let's talk about the prop, the list price, the list price, whatever the list price, obviously. Friend, you, yes. Um, Deb Stanitz. Uh, Deb. So if if there is another contract, do you put do you put yes and then annotate it at the bottom? Yes, you will put yes, and you see where it explain it says if yes, explain, then just explain it. Yes, yes, and say hey, uh, the contract there is a listing contract that expires November thirtieth, and this one will begin December one. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and the uh, list price, make sure you put the real list price. Don't don't put. Now here's just a, a just a uh, something I do, and I'm and I I'm just like to hear from some of the other agents. Some that anytime I take a list and that I think it's just a little high. Let's say I go into a property and they want to sell a property for two hundred thousand. I think the property's one seventy five, but I said you know what in this seller's market I'm willing to try it even though I still only think it's worth 175. What I will do, I'll say, okay, how about we do this? Let's list it at, one, at 200. But on this date, I wanted to reduce it to 170, or reduce it to what, whatever that number is on a certain date. I will write it in this contract so I don't have to come back to the seller because once, you t once the seller gives you a price, most of us know they'll say, okay, I'm gonna reduce it in a couple of weeks. When you come back to reduce it, they're like, well, Let's keep it there for another month. But if you already negotiate that and put it in contract on this date, we reduce this property from two hundred thousand to one eighty nine. You don't have to now go back to the seller to get permission because they've already agreed to it here. I always do that when I'm selling a property or listing a property where I think we know it's a little high, but the seller say, "Okay, let's start it there." But I'm willing to reduce it. I say, "Well, give me the date." That you want to reduce it, we're gonna we're gonna material memorialize it in this listing contract so that on the date that it's supposed to be lowered, I don't have to come back and ask permission. That anybody like that? 
Anybody? Yeah, I, I did. Where you that, put um, that do you put that right on the price line? I would put it under additional. I put it in at the end under. Yeah. Okay. Look at the bottom. Additional terms on the last page, line three hundred eight. I would just put it in three hundred eight. That on December one, seller agrees that broker will reduce uh, price from two hundred thousand to one eighty nine or one seventy nine, whatever. And then they sign off on it. And so now you can't come back and say, well, I decided to change. I mean, obviously the seller can then still change your mind, but but it's there. I don't have to go back and ask for permission to do it. Uh, did someone else say something? No. All right. So the property. So the list of property address. Clearly, you know the address, the, the municipality, whether it's a, what city, if we're talking Philadelphia, obviously county would be Philadelphia. If you're outside of Philadelphia, it could be Delaware County, Montgomery County, Bucks County, Berks County. Professor Trent, yeah. sorry. Can we go back for a little bit? Yeah. So let's just say I'm talking to the seller. I'm, I would say after the first two weeks, we'll reduce it and have that in writing. But what if, can I put another two weeks after that to reduce it down Absolutely. on I, writing? I've done that. Absolutely. That's exactly what I would do. If I still think one's, one's 89 is too high and I think the price is 175, absolutely. I would say, and on this date, we'll reduce it further. Absolutely. And I've never had a problem because now sellers know that it's in writing. I highlight it. I make them, I even want them to initial next to that so they don't even forget. So they can't yes. say, oh, I don't remember that in there. No, I'm like, okay, let's negotiate this now. It's always best, in my opinion, to negotiate everything up front before the contract signed, then to wait to the contract sign, then try to go back and negotiate things. It's easier before you sign a contract while you sit in there, get hash everything out. I've never had a problem. I've never had a problem doing it that way. And it always works. And I've been in this business a long time. Mm, thank right. you. You're welcome. All right, so go back to school district. If here is the only issue in Philadelphia school district doesn't matter because you know we don't you know no one goes to neighborhood. What well, let's just say it doesn't matter in Philadelphia, but in the county school district is where it matters. Most people go out to the county because of the school district. They move out to the county but they have children because they want to be in a specific school district. One of the things that I I see well I just tell you this quick story. Then years ago I was in Abington closing on a deal. I heard all this commotion at the settlement room next to it. So I kind of get thirsty. So I go out to get some water because I was really thirsty and very thirsty. So I'm listening. Not, but I, I hear what's going on because I was thirsty and uh, really thirsty. So I wanted to make sure I heard everything. And uh, so what was going on, the seller is, uh, they're sitting at the settlement table and the seller says, but she's going to, she can't wait to put her two sons into this a particular school district, I think it's Copper Beach or Cooper Beach. I was it was at that point, it was at that time it was a blue ribbon school district. So um, so she says, um, so the seller says, well, oh no, your sons won't go to that elementary school. They go to a different elementary school. And she's oh no, 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 they go to this one. She's oh no, they don't. So the so the buyer says, well, I'm not buying the property. Five or six hundred thousand dollar property. Buyer gets up, says, I'm not signing anything. The list of the MLS, or the, the, the MLS sheet had the wrong elementary school. Her, her buyer never thought to check. Buyer never thought to have her check. No one ever thought to check because the client moved out to Abington for one reason, to put her two sons in a particular elementary school. She buys a five or $600,000 house and she gets up and she leaves because the MLS sheet is wrong and her agent was, did not even think, which don't ever do this, didn't even think that my client is moving to a school district for one reason only, to put her two sons into a particular elementary school. And what happens? She learns at settlement that her, her two sons will go to a different elementary school. And so she walks out and she sues her agent. Oh. So not only did the commission, they did not get a commission, but it got a lawsuit. So it. Yeah. So it's the buyer's agent job to call no, the school. No, I didn't say that. I did say it's your job, but you may you can put it on her. You could have said, "I'll check, you check." I want you to make sure this is correct, seller. I mean, buyer. You don't have. That's not your job. But if it's if you know your client has one reason for buying a house, 
why not do some work to make sure that this is the right elementary school? What I would have done, I would have checked, but I also would say to the buyer, you check to make sure this is correct. Put it on your client. You don't have to take that liability. You can say, hey, make sometimes this MLS stuff is wrong. Make sure you check that, that I want you to verify that this is the right elementary school. I would say, I'm gonna do it also. And we come back with the same answer. In this case, we would have, been, we would have come back and we would have both learned they're wrong. You could go online and, and check, but I'm not saying, but don't hear me saying that it's your responsibility. It's not your responsibility and you don't need, I believe agents should take on as little liability as possible. All right? So, but, yeah. so jumping, jumping contracts for a minute, um, in the buyer agency contract, if that is that absolute sticking point for your buyer, would it be better to put in there that, you know, buyer will verify? You, you know, can put in there. Different. Absolutely. You can put that. Okay. Absolutely. I would, I would put that on my client. I would check it, but I'm also going, but I want the liability to fall on her. I would have said to my client, I want you to verify that this is correct. Thank you do you. whatever you want to verify. And if, she, and if she did, she would have found out it was wrong. I would have also checked, but I would have put it on my buyer. I don't want to take on that extra responsibility because what if I'm, what if I make a mistake? now is on me, all right? Uh, but just make sure when you're selling in the counties that those school districts, go online. You can usually put the address in and, and it'll tell you what school, what the elementary school, what the ele high school is, what the junior high school is. But sometimes I've even found that you may put the address in, but if one elementary school is full, then, then the overflow goes to a different one. So you got to make sure you do your due diligence. That's all I'm saying. Whatever you think that due diligence is, that's what you need to do. All right. Um, the uh, present, the zoning, what's the zoning? You find, again, when you pull up public records, you, records you'll see the zoning. Residential is probably going to be like an RS5A. And then uh, put, make sure you put residential. I mean, put the uh, zoning classification. Remember an agreement sale, you don't have to put the zoning classification if it's zoned residential. You only have to do it as zoned commercial. But I believe that even in the agreement sale, never leave blanks. It's best to fill it in because I never know if you, you meant to leave it blank or you forgot to fill it in. Even if you don't have to fill something in, fill it in, zero or N-A. Don't ever leave anything blank in these contracts. Zero, N-A. If it doesn't apply, N-A. Because again, when I look at a listing contract or I look at your agreement sale that you send me, I don't know if you meant to leave it blank or I don't know if you forgot to fill it in. But if you put N-A, I know you meant to leave it blank. I mean, that this is not a plot. All right. Um, so the identification, I mean, the present use. Present use, you would just say something like is a uh, residential one, uh, two family dwelling. I mean, just say what it is. What is it used for? Or is it three used as a, as a views right now as a three family dwelling? It may be zoned as a two family dwelling, but it's used as a three family dwelling. You probably want to say that. If it's used, uh, if it's not you, if it's zoned as a duplex, but it's, but it's used as a triplex, then you probably need to say that because that yeah. is information that the buyer needs to know that is basically being used, it has an illegal use. All right, uh, the starting contract, paragraph two, when does this contract start? It just starts when, the, uh, when it's signed by both the broker and the seller. Just one piece of advice. Always have the seller sign this contract first. You sign it after you get it back, and then you know when the execution date is. The execution date is a date that both the seller and the broker, or you're, you're the agent for the, you're the representative for the broker, sign this contract. If you sign it first and send it to the broker, then, I mean, to the seller. The seller may sign it today, she may sign it tomorrow, or, and you get it back, and then you don't really know which the date it starts. It's easier for you to send it to the seller. Seller signs a Saturday. You sign it Saturday. As soon as you get it back, or you sign it Sunday, whatever the date you sign it, that's the execution. That's the date that this contract now begins. It's easier to do it that way because you'll know when you signed it. You may not know when the seller signed it. Maybe you can't read that whether she signed it at 16th or the 17th. Give it to the seller to sign first. You sign it after. Then you know the date that this contract starts because remember if you say it ends it ends it ends in 30 days 30 days may make a difference i mean if you whether well, one day may make a difference the seller says my contract expires the end of this month you say no it expires the second of december you don't want any issues just go ahead 
and have the seller sign it first and you sign it after. All right. Um, when is it in? Uh, remember, a listing contract cannot be more than one year. First of all, so put a date there. Don't put, sometimes I've seen agents write three months. It ends in three months. Well, okay. Put a date. It ends December 31st, 2020. It ends November 30th, 2020. It's better to put a date on the day when it ends and not it ends in two months from today or it ends in three weeks. Put a date. It's always easy. You want these things to be as clear as possible so that you don't have any problems. You don't, no one can wonder if it's three months. Okay, do they mean we had 31 days in this month? So is it three full? Just, just put a date and you eliminate any confusion. Any questions? Dual agency, paragraph three, dual agency. We all know what dual agency it is. Dual agency, you have to tell the seller that you possibly could be a dual agent. Dual agent means I could represent both the buyer and the seller, or I could, my company could have both. I'm representing you as a seller, but one of the agents of my company could represent the buyer. That still would be a dual agency. Dual agency is if I'm the agent representing the seller and the buyer in the same transaction. Dual agency is also when I represent the seller, but another one of my one of my colleagues in my office has the buyer. That still creates a dual agency because we both work under the same broker. Remember the contract between the broker and the seller, between the broker and the buyer. So if the buyer and the seller are in the same office, then they would be a dual agent. So some sellers will tell you, I don't want you to be a dual agent. So you need to talk about that at the listen con, uh, uh, presentation. And the other one's a designated agency. If your office practices uh, designated agency, then you would check the box on paragraph five, where it said uh, four, where it says designated agency is ap applicable. Uh, let's check here. Below, broker designates the licensees or the salespersons above to exclusively represent the interests of the seller if the licensee is also blah, blah, blah. So if you are designated, there are a lot of offices now of going to designated agency to avoid dual agency. All right. So if you're a designated agency office, you would know that you would say you would, you should explain that to your seller that we don't practice dual agency. We practice designated agency, which means that we won't be a dual agent. So I represent your interest, but if another person in my office brings a buyer, they will be a, they will represent the interest of the buyer and we don't discuss anything. They don't know what I'm talking to you about. I owe you complete confidentiality. I don't know what the buyer, I have no, I know nothing about the buyer. I can't, we can't share information. My interest, my loyalty lies exclusively with you and that other agent in my office, his or her loyalty lies with that buyer and we do not discuss anything. All right. Yeah, but you don't want to check that because it says it. I'm sorry, agency. it says it's not. I'm sorry, I just looked at that. Right, if it's not, that's if, yeah, thank you, I just see not. All right, so if, if it's, you don't check it, right, if it is designated agency, don't check that. If it does not apply, you will check it. It says designated agency is not applicable. Thank you. All right, number five, broker's fee. Uh, your fee, remember fees can't be discussed. And I know people do this all the time. Remember, it is an antitrust violation to discuss fees brokerage fees, management fees, commissions outside of your office. One broker cannot discuss fees with another broker. That is an antitrust violation. That's called price fixing. I can't call another broker and say, hey, how much did you charge for managing a property? Well, if I do that, I have committed a felony. I cannot reach out to another broker, but a broker can set any fees that he or she wants for his or her own office. So when you, so, uh, and it says there, no association of realtors has set or recommended the broker's fee. Broker and seller have negotiated the fee, the seller will pay broker and broker's fee is blank. You put in whatever, 8%, 9%, whatever it is. And it says, let's say it's 8%. Broker's fee is 8% of the sales price, or you could have a flat fee of 20, let's say 20,000. Broker's fee is 8%. Of the, uh, uh, of the sale price or 20,000, whichever is greater and blank. And if there is an additional fee, if there's no additional fee, put NA, don't leave it blank. So it either gonna be a percentage or it's gonna be a flat fee. And if you charge the seller an additional fee, then you will put that there. But if there's no additional fee, leave, put NA or put zero, do not leave it blank. Because again, I don't know if you meant to leave it blank or if you forgot to fill it in. Trent, I have a quick question for you really quickly. Yeah, um, one second. Someone just asked, 
what if you want the broker? Can you could you could you put that question back up? What I saw a question from somebody. Hold on. What if you want the broker? I uh, didn't. All right. Can, I can't. What what if you want the broker's fee to be deducted from your commission as a courtesy? The broker's fee. Uh, I I don't know. I don't. The broker's fee to be con deducted from your. I I don't know. I've never heard of a broker's fee being conduct deducted from the. I mean, broker's fee to be deducted from your commission. Oh, it's your friend's property. I think you better talk to your broker because I don't know if your broker is going to allow you to deduct the broker's fee from a commission. Don't I, talk to your broker about that. I would never allow one of my agents to do that. I, I, I would not. Just talk to your broker. Don't do that. Talk to your broker about deducting. Remember, the commission belongs to the broker. You get part of it, but that's the broker's money. You don't want to usually, you don't start deducting anything out of the broker's money without first getting permission. Now, who had a question? Someone had a question? Who was saying something? Someone was saying something. All right. All right. Go back to. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. I put it, I put it in the chat so you can, so you can read it. Well, just ask a question. I, oh, it, in, in what instance would you list a commission on the net? sales price i recently saw that net stuff i i, I listen and I, I i net i just think that I, I don't know maybe i'm biased i can't stand it when people give me a net just what's the commission the commission is based on the commission should be based on the, the sales price not the net after the seller pays its sellers a sit it's easier you see a lot you see that more and more i i have an issue with it but however you want to do it I think it's easier to just say the commission is 3%. I'm going to get 3% of the sales price to the other, to the cooperating broker, as opposed to 3% of the net. So I got to subtract out the, 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 the uh, seller system we give it. You can do that. I just find it easier just to do 3% of the commission, 3% of the sales price. I just find it easier to do it that way. Does someone else had a question? All right, go back to now. Look at that other paragraph, the B1, where it says blank of the broker's fee is earned and due at signing this listing contract. Now, that would be if you were charging this seller a non refundable fee at closing. Most people probably don't do that, but again, your office may. If your office does, keep in mind that whatever, let's say the fee you charge them is $20,000. And you're charging them a $1,000 upfront fee. That $1,000 is part of that broker's fee. It's not in addition to it. All right. So if you're charging them uh, $20,000, but they have to pay $1,000 upfront, that $1,000 is deducted from the twenty. It is not addition. That line. That line is not in addition to. It is not. Is the fee is part of the broker's fee. It's not in addition to it. All right. So if you did pay, if you did charge them anything up front, you need to deduct it from what the total fee that they would owe you. Uh, paragraph two, any questions? Is this helping anyone? Yes, it is. Yes. All right, number two, seller will pay the, uh, seller will pay the balance of the broker's fee if, and here is that you have to have this language if it's an exclusive right to sell contract. The property or any ownership interest in it is sold or exchanged on the term of this contract by the broker, broker's licensee, that's salesperson, seller, or by any other person or broker as the listing price or any price acceptable to the seller. So it doesn't matter who brings forth the buyer within an exclusive right to sell contract, the brokerage has earned the commission no, no matter who brings the buyer. And that's that paragraph. That's what that says. That has, that's the language that's needed in order to make it an exclusive right to sell contract. All right. Also, the sellers, uh, the seller pay the balance if uh, a ready, willing, and able buyer is found. found. Uh, a willing buyer is one who will pay the listed price or more for the property, one who has submitted an offer that's been accepted by the seller, or negotiations that are pending at the end of the date of this contract is on the sale or a seller finds an agreement sale, the D, seller defaults. If the seller changes his or her mind, seller one day says, hey, we have an offer. We're supposed to go to settlement. I changed my mind. Well, the seller still owes your company a commission. Sellers can't just decide they're not going to sell the property. The buyer has some recourse because the buyer can sue them for uh, specific performance. But also, you can ask the seller, hey, you breached, you just breached the contract. You defaulted. You owe us twenty thousand dollars. Otherwise, your broker may sue for that twenty thousand. So just because a seller decides 
that he or she doesn't want to sell a property to the buyer. If you have a fully executed contract, you can't just change your mind. You still owe that commission. And that's what this contract says. And then you E, if the property or any part of it is taken by eminent domain. If the state comes and says, hey, we're going to take this property from eminent domain, and they give that seller money, that seller still owes you commission off of whatever the, the state gave that person. Let's say maybe they're selling it for 200, but the state gave them to 300. Well, they owe you a commission based off of whatever the sales price is. Because the sales price, so they still owe you a commission even if it was taken by, it says the property or any part of it is taken by any government for public use, that's eminent domain, in which case seller will pay from any money paid by the government. Or that last paragraph, F, is what we call that broker protection clause. Make sure, this is important to everybody. Make sure you make sure you get this one. A sale occurs after the ending date, the ending date, that's when the date the contract expires. If one, the sale occurs within blank days of the ending contract, write in something, maybe 30 days, 60 days, put in something. So in other words, if you're negotiating the contract, let's say you negotiate now and the contract expired, the listing contract expires tomorrow. And the seller says, wait a minute, the contract's going to expire tomorrow. I'm just not going to reach out to my client, my buy, my seller, I mean, my agent until Monday. And then the contract expired and I'm going to go right to the buyer and sell it to that buyer directly and not pay a commission. That's one of the reasons this broker protection clause is there. So sellers can't do that. So now, even if you negotiated right now, contract expires Sunday and the seller doesn't get back to you until Monday and says, Oh, well, the contract expired. You say, well, no, even if this buyer buys this property, this buyer we're negotiating with buys this property within, and let's say you put 30 days in there, within 30 days, I have still earned the commission. Most people will put 30 to 60 days, 30 or 60 days, you can put 45. I generally put 60 days, I mean, 30 days, because if you're negotiating the contract, uh, you don't want the, your negotiations to be stalled. And then the listing contract expires and then the seller goes and sells it to that buyer. So you can put 30, 60, whatever, 90, whatever you want, but make sure you put something in there. All right. So, um, and it says that a sale occurs after the end date of this contract. If the sale occurs within, let's say, 30 days of the end of the day, and two, the buyer was shown or negotiated to buy the property during the term of this contract. And number three, the property is not listed under an exclusive right to sell contract with another broker. So if they, they already have another exclusive right to sell contract, then you will not be able to collect the commission. All right. But if they don't already have one, it's probably likely they won't already have one. And you did the negotiations before you're basically the procuring cause. And now they buy that property after this and contract is expired. You are still, your, the brokerage is still entitled to a commission. All right. Any questions? If they lift it, list it with another brokerage at the end of the term and you have this agreement that's in negotiation, what happens to the commission on that? in you that case? You just don't get it, which I think is unfair. This says that remember, what if you had another, uh, my first example, let's say they listen contract expires at the end of this month and they've already hired a new company to take over December 1st, then according to this, they would have a new exclusive right to sell and you would be entitled. I don't agree with that. I would still think, I would still fight that. I don't think that makes any sense to me, Deb, and I'm sure it doesn't to you. Because if you you basically are the procuring cause and now they quickly get a new exclusive right to sell listing, and now you're saying that Deb is not entitled to the commission when she was the one who brought forth this buyer, I would still, I would probably challenge that. But I've never seen anybody have a, another exclusive right to sell listing contract in place a day after either. I've never seen that. But I, I don't, but I, I don't, I think there's a problem with that right there, that last number three. I do think that there's an issue. All right. Um, number six, paragraph six, broker's fee if settlement does not occur. Make sure you put something there. If this settlement does not, if an agreement of sale is signed and settlement does not occur, in other words, that buyer defaults, the seller will pay broker, I'm sorry, seller will pay broker blank of the deposit money. So if the seller, if the buyer defaults, buyer put down $5,000 as an earnest money deposit, 
buyer defaults, buyer loses his or her earnest money deposit, how much of that is the seller entitled to? You may put 50%. Some offices have 50%. They get they they keep 50, they give the seller 50. Some the seller gets 100 percent Some offices they get 100 percent because they marketed the property, they put money out, they put time. You have to decide with your office. Your office may have a policy. My office is 50-50. We have to, you have to give 50 because my we go have done some work. I'm not gonna give 100 percent to the seller. I don't think it's fair for my agent not to get anything if the buyer defaults, even though we're gonna sell it again. But the seller, I believe the buyer ought to be, I mean, the agent ought to be entitled to something. But if you have a, if your office has 50, 50, 100 goes here, 100, you, whatever your office says, but if your office does not have a policy, it's probably good at least put 50, 50. Don't give the seller 100% of uh, the monies if the buyer defaults, because you did put work into it and you shouldn't be out of nothing. You should get nothing out of that. Number seven, any questions, by the way? Number seven, the cooperation, cooperation with other brokers. If you're going to cooperate with the most broker, other brokers, which most of us do, then you would say, how much commission are you giving them? I'm not even going to talk about sub-agent because most, I don't know anybody who practices sub-agency, but two, uh, B represents the buyer, the buyer's agent. How much will you give that buyer's agent? Here's one thing you don't want to put in there. Put a percentage. Put 2%, 2.5%, 3%, 4%. Do not put a question mark. Or don't put negotiable. I've seen contracts where the, they say negotiable. It shouldn't be negotiable. You're telling the seller, I'm going to share the commission with the cooperating broker. I'm, you're going to pay me 7%. I'm going to give 3.5% to the cooperating broker. Or seller, I'm getting 7%, but I'm going to give 3% to the cooperating broker. Um, do not put, put a percentage there because a seller, because that's what you need to put in MLS. You need to put whatever's in there. If you said you're going to give 3.5% to cooperating broker, put 3.5. Here's sometimes agents would do, they'll get a contract that says, I'm getting a commission of 7%. I'm going to share, I'm going to give 3.5 to the cooperating broker company. And then they put in MLS 3% or 2.5%. And they wait to see what kind of agent you are. If you're not a good agent, they give you 2.5 and they keep the rest. If you're a good agent, they'll come back and say, oh, by the way, Trent, you know, I really liked you. By the way, I'm going to share the commission with you. And I, I'm like, oh, well, that was nice. Because when I got the settlement and found out you didn't, it, we would have had a problem. Even though technically you can, you can share, you can give me anything you want. Uh, but sometimes when agents pull this stuff, I, I've asked an agent once, I said, what did your listing contract say? You know, you got a 7% commission and gave me two and a half. What is your, did you tell your seller when you signed the listing contract? Oh, by the way, I'm going to hope a buyer, another agent brings forth a buyer, but I'm not going to give them, I'm not going to share the commission. I'm going to give them 2% and I'm going to keep 5%. And your seller says, oh, I think that's a good idea. Oh, I think no seller would say that. Most of the time, agents are going to be honest. Most of the agents, most of the time, agents are going to split the, commission, but they not they don't have to split it. There's nothing, there's no law that says they have to split it. They could give you 2% and they can keep five. But um, I believe you ought to split it. That's just my personal opinion. And then um, my glasses are breaking. Uh, and then broker does not represent the buyer or the seller. Uh, that means if there's a transaction licensee, that are you going to pay a transaction licensee that means that person's basically a transaction licensee simply does paperwork. Um, am I going to pay a transaction licensee when I represent the seller to have another agent only do paperwork but not represent the buyer? Uh, it's up to you. Um, I'm not paying a transaction licensee. I want the buyer to be represented. I'll tell you, I'll pay you as long as you represent the buyer, but I don't want you to say the buyer is not represented but I want part of the commission. I just, that's just my personal opinion. Number eight, duties of the broker and the seller. Uh, number, uh, broker is acting as a seller's agent to market the property, negotiate with potential buyers. Broker will use reasonable efforts to find a buyer for the property. Seller will cooperate the broker and assist in the seller of the property. All the things that we know that we do as agents, seller's agents, uh, all showings, um, I say, uh, go to e D where it says if the property is rented, seller will give any leases to broker before signing his contract. If you represent a seller and there is a lease involved, make sure at the time you sign this listing contract, you get a copy of all the leases. 
ask the seller before you come there, hey, make copies of the leases. So I will have the leases, all right? Get a copy of all the leases and because you need to know how much, how much rent uh, buyers are paying, I mean, tenants are paying, how much security deposits, the uh, seller is holding an escrow. You wanna get all that information up front. If they say, I don't have leases, then you should say to that sellers, I want you to write down what it is. I want you to put something in writing telling me basically I'm a memorandum of lease that says the name of the tenant, how much the lease, when that lease, what kind of lease they have, a yearly, year long leases, month to month, what is the rent, how much security deposit they have, and are they current? And give me, tell me how have they paid rent? Or how do they pay rent? Because that you should create a rent roll. If I'm buying a multi, if I'm buying a property, if I'm an investor and I'm buying a triplex, I want to know if those tenants pay the rent on time. I don't want to buy a property and learn that I have to evict three tenants in the next three months. And right now you can't evict them anyhow. So I definitely want to buy now where I can't evict anybody and I'm not collecting rent. So you want to make sure if you buy, if you're selling a property where there's a tenant make sure you get that seller to give you copies of the leases. If they don't have leases, have them create memorandum, a memorandum of lease. All right, any questions? And E, something that some I think a lot of people don't realize, E says the seller will not enter into renew or modify any leases or enter into any option to sell during the term of this lease without the broker's written consent. If the seller, once I enter, and once this you sign a the seller signs a contract on a, a agreement sale with that uh, buyer, that seller cannot renew a lease. That seller cannot that seller cannot put in a new tenant. That seller can't do anything without the permission of that buyer, uh, who's acting to uh, or the permission of the broker who's acting on behalf of the buyer. Because think of it this way: if I'm going to buy your duplex, I'm getting an FHA loan. I need to live in one of the units so I have to occupy within 60 days and you now go, it's vacant and you go and get put someone in there and they have a one year lease. Well, I can't, I can't occupy it. I can't get that FHA and short loan because I'm now, I, it's going to be an investment property. It's going to be, an, it's not going to be an owner occupant. I'm not going to be an owner occupant. I'm going to be an investor, which means I can't even qualify for an FHA loan. So sell, tell your sellers, Listen, right now, once we go on the contract, do not modify leases, don't create new leases, don't extend new leases, don't do anything without getting permission. Let me know what you want to do. I'll go back to the buyer's agent and the buyer's agent may say, oh, you got a tenant for the third floor? Fine, put them in there. Uh, they pay 1500 great, put them in. But they may say, no, I have a tenant, I'm going to put it on the third floor. I don't want you to put anybody in there. All right, so just keep that in mind if you represent a seller um, uh, in a, in a uh, multifamily <laughs> that they should not do anything uh, without the permission of that buyer. Um, Professor Trent, so hello. Yes. So literally yesterday I talked to this potential seller. Um, she has two tenants and I asked to see all the lease and she has nothing in writing. Right. Tell her create a memorandum of lease. Memorandum of lease. Right. Okay. Just basically, you write it down. What instead of you, you just selling me. I don't have a lease. Like I said, give me the names of all the tenants. I mean, the names of the people on the lease who live there. Give me the, the amount of the rent. Tell me the amount of security deposit you're holding. When the lease expires, and how much? And then give me. Tell me how they pay rent. If they a month, them tell me in the last since they've been here, how do they pay rent? Do they pay? Tell me when, because you have proof. When you, they either give you a check, they pay Venmo, they pay Cash App, they give you a money order. They somehow, you should be able to go back and say, this tenant's been here six months. The first month they paid on the third. The second month they paid on the 15th and there was a late fee of $50. The third month they paid on the second. They should be able to, you should be, they should be able to create that. Go back and create that for you because a new buyer wants to know how this person pays rent. If they pay rent late every month, I may not want that building because maybe I know I may figure that I'm going to have to eventually evict someone and I don't want to buy a unit where the first thing I have to do is come in and evict someone. 
because of non-payment or slow pay. I, I, so yeah, just have them create that. All so right. Quick, can I ask yes. a question on that? Yes. Go on. I'm listening. I thought I thought someone said something. All right. Deposit monies. The paragraph. Oh, paragraph 10, buyer's not responsible for damages. I mean, broker not responsible for damages. Seller agrees that broker and the broker's licensees or salespeople are not responsible for any damage to the property or any loss or theft or personal goods from the property unless such damage, loss or theft is solely and directly caused by the broker or their licensees or salespeople. So make sure brokers and sellers understand that if someone comes into the unit and something is stolen, you don't sue me. I'm not responsible if an agent comes in and his buyer steals something or the agent steals something. I'm that I'm not, you're holding me harmless. You can't blame me unless I did it, unless I wouldn't have stole it. Absolutely, you can hold me uh, responsible. But you, but you should tell a seller, and I tell every seller this: anything of value that you have, you should put away. People are going to be coming into your house. All right. Now, I've been in this business a long time. I've never, ever once heard of someone going into someone's house stealing something. So is it possible? Yeah. So if you have a $50,000 diamond ring, you probably should put it away somewhere. Maybe you should lock it up. Maybe you should buy a small safe if you're about to sell your property and put anything of value in that safe. Don't leave a $50,000 diamond ring in your top drawer so that if someone opens it, they see it. So you tell sellers, people are going to come in, strangers are coming into your house. Now people put video cameras, you know, I, I don't really like being in a house without more camera, but keep in mind, if your seller has video cameras, that's one thing, but they cannot record you. Let them know that they cannot listen in on a conversation that without permission. Now, I've seen sellers do that. They cannot listen in on conversations. If your seller has video and they have some type of audio, tell them they cannot that is not, you cannot listen in on my conversation without my permission. And they should not do that. Clearly they can video, it's their property, but they shouldn't listen in on conversations. All right. I have, yeah, I have a question. I'm sorry, I was muted before. Um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I was gonna ask with regard to the leases, um, if you get your seller to sign that when there is no existing lease, do you also want the tenants to sign? Because I'm thinking that the new buyer- Absolutely, yes, you want goes, the tenants, absolutely. Okay. The tenant needs to know I'm by wait, wait, the tenant or the new buyer? No, the, the tenant, because I'm thinking after oh, closing, right. what if yes. they well, go the to the tenant? tenant? With it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And I, yes. Thank you. you would have a memorandum of lease, you would have a tenant sign. Because the tenant would say, wait a minute, my lease, my rent is not 875, it's 775. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. No, and I'm glad you said that. that's a good point. And yes, I'm glad you said that. Get the tenant to sign that because the tenant has to agree. Because the tenant may say, no, I gave you $1,000 security. Remember, you made me, because my credit wasn't that great, you made me put down an extra 500 So, right, you make sure the tenant says, yes, all of this is correct. And now, and that you should get the tenant to sign it, and you should also get the new buyer to sign it. That way, everybody understands that this is a security deposit that I should get when I buy the property. This is how much your rent is. This is when you've already paid this month. You know, uh, you paid on February, uh, November 14th, so I shouldn't come in looking for rent from you. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. Good point. Uh, number, where are we? Uh, 11, deposit money. Uh, obviously, broker has to put the money in an escrow. We already know broker has, when you get an escrow check, you have to give it to your broker immediately, and your broker has three business days, I mean, three business days to put that money into his or her escrow account three business days. That's what the law requires. The business doc, uh, you give your, you give that check to your broker immediately and that broker has to put it into his or her escrow account immediately. All right. Um, now B, 11B, deposit money is also, this is something you need to explain to a seller because sometimes sellers don't understand this. Regardless of their parent entitlement to deposit monies, Pennsylvania law does not allow a broker holder deposit monies to determine who is entitled to the deposit monies when settlement does not occur. So keep in mind that even the buyer breaches the contract, the buyer wakes up in the morning and says, I don't want the house. I'm clearly in violation. I breach his contract. Buyer put down 10,000 sellers says, hey, the buyer breached the contract. I listen contract says I get 50%. You get 50%. Give me 5,000 and you get 5,000. No, the broker says, no, I cannot give, do that. The only way I can give money 
I'm now, once there's a breach, I cannot determine who the money goes to unless it's an arbitration or mediation, there's a court order or the buyer and the seller mutually agree to who gets it. Broker becomes the escrow holder of that, the escrow agent only. And all that broker is doing at that point when there's a breach is holding that money. They can't decide who's right and who's wrong. Even though that buyer clearly breached the contract, the buyer may say, I breached it because of something the seller did. So we have to go into uh, arbitration or we have to go into mediation. So let sellers know that even if there's a breach, the, my broker, cannot just determine who's right or wrong. We have to we have to have another tribunal has to decide who gets the money. Or the buyer could come and say, all right, give me back. It's I put down 10,000, give me five, and you get five. So I'm okay with that. But it has to be, all right. Trent, excuse me. Different ones. If you say B1, it says now it says uh, if an agreement sale is terminated prior to settlement and there's no dispute over entitlement to the money, a written agreement signed by both parties is evidence that there's no dispute. So both the buyer and the seller said, this is where the money goes. The broker can distribute that money. Two, if after the broker has received deposit money, the broker receives a written agreement that is signed by the buyer and the seller directing broker how to give out, distribute the money. Hey, uh, I want all of it. I agree to give it all to you. Fine. Uh, I can give you, uh, the broker can then release that money to that party. Three, according to the terms of a final order of court, the court says, this is where that money goes. The broker says, I can release it to you now. And four, according to the terms of a prior written agreement between the buyer and the seller that directs the buyer how to distribute the deposit monies if there's a dispute between the parties that is not resolved. And the agreement sale, paragraph 26 says that within a certain number of days, if the seller has not initiated mediation or litigation, uh, then that broker can give that money, release that money back to the buyer. So if they, and your agreement sale says within 30 days, if the seller has not initiated litigation or if the seller has not initiated mediation, then that broker can, the seller, the buyer can ask for that money. And within 30 days, the agreement sale says the broker can then release the money. All right. Any questions? Paragraph 12. Seller agrees a broker may list other properties for sale and a broker may sell and show and sell other properties to prospective buyers. Why is that there? Because sometimes sellers, I don't know where they get it. Sometimes they think you're the only client. They think that you're not listing other properties. You're not working for anyone else. That's also in the buyer agency contract where it says that to buyers, hey, you understand this property I'm showing to you can also be shown to other buyers. I may show you this property, but I may have three other buyers who I'm gonna show that property to. So they have to understand just because I am listing your property, I'm gonna list other properties. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not just working. Uh, I can show other properties. I can list other properties. That seems common sense, but sometimes sellers don't. Buyers, I think, have more problems understanding that than sellers. And 13 additional offers, unless prohibited by a seller. Just keep when you get an offer, just make sure you remember this, especially newer agents. If an agent calls you and says, "Hey," um, uh, Christy, are there any offers? Then Christy has to say, unless the seller told her not to answer that question, and then she can say, my seller directed me not to answer. Christy has to say where, whether she has offers and who those offers are coming from. That's what she has to say. Let's say she has two offers, one from one of the agents in her office and one from a co-op. She has to say, I have two offers, one from, a, one in, one from an uh, agent in my office and one from a co-op from another office. She doesn't have to say how much, she doesn't say who they are, but she has to tell whoever asks, another agent asks, unless the seller prohibits her from doing that, she needs to say, and if she, and one of those offers is, one of, one of them is her own, she has to then say, oh, I have written up an offer and I have two offers from co-ops. So now I'm the agent and I need, to, I know, okay, Christy wrote up one, so she probably got the best one. So maybe, you know, I, I may have to offer something higher. I may have to kind of, you know, try to get more into Chrissy's head to figure out what it is that, uh, uh, what I need to offer. So just a look at that because they just don't do this. It Excuse says, me. unless prohibited by the seller, the sellers aren't going to prohibit you from doing this. If broker is asked by a buyer or another licensee about the existence of other offers on the property, broker will reveal the existence of other offers and whether they were obtained by the licensee, that's you, the, like, the salesperson, identified in his contract by another salesperson or licensees working with the broker or by a licensee or salesperson working for a different broker. 
Once the seller enters into an agreement sale, the broker is not required to present other offers. So you don't have to present an offer, obviously, once, um, once you, uh, once the seller signs the contract. Someone asked. Hey, I had a question, Trent. Um, yeah, okay, sure. okay, I understand that. Uh, sometimes we've been asked this, how many, how many offers do you, are you, are, do you have to tell the number of offers? I don't think you have to tell a number. You just to say where they're coming from. You can say I have, I have all the offers. I have multiple offers. All of them are from co-ops. Okay. Okay. Now, I and then I'll say, now if someone asked me, I would give them the number. Again, okay. I always believe in this. Over disclosure is better than under disclosure. What's wrong with saying I have 10 offers? Okay. Five of them are from, eight of them are from co-ops. Two of them are from, uh, from, from uh, agents in my office. Why not just say that? I would okay. give you the number. Okay. All right. Is there any advantage to the seller not to disclose multiple offers? Say that again, Deb. It, it, what would be an advantage to a seller to not prohibit to you? Right. I don't know. I don't think there is one. That's why I said, I don't know of a seller saying, hey, Deb, don't tell people I got offers. Because I want you to say I got 10 offers. Because you know what Deb's going to do? She's going to say, are you really serious? They got 10 offers. Let's let's give them more than this price. Let's give them a really good offer. Let's not play a game. They have all these offers. We're not going to play around with this. But this, yeah, I mean, I don't know why a seller would ever say, don't tell people what, that I have other offers. You're not telling them the amount. You're simply saying, yes, I have multiple offers. And someone asked, how about a title company yeah, holding that deposit? A title company can hold the deposit, but keep in mind with the title company, if the title company holds the offer, the title company is not uh, bound by the Real Estate License and Registration Act or the Real Estate rule, uh, the Real Estate Commission's rules and regulations. So in other words, if a person, if there is a dispute and the title company releases that money, you know, the title company's holding it. They're not bound by the same rules and regulations and laws that the broker is bound by. Just keep that in mind, that a title company may have his own rules and regulations about maybe they decide that buyer is entitled to this commission and I'm going to release them. So just keep that in mind. If a title company is holding it, they're not bound by what the broker is bound by. Title company is not bound by the Real Estate License Registration Act or by the Real Estate Commission's rules and regulations. Uh, can you represent a buyer for the same property you are the listing agent for? Uh, yes, but I think that's a lot. Uh, I think, can you represent a buyer for the same property you're the listing agent? Oh, I'm sorry. You listen. I thought you, I thought I said that you were selling. Yes, absolutely. People do it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. You can represent a buyer if you're the listing agent. Absolutely. You're just a dual agent. Absolutely. I actually thought you were asking, can I be, if I'm the seller, and I'm the listing agent on my properties, then should I represent the buyer? I would not recommend that. I think that's a lot. I'm selling my property. I'm listening through my company. And now I also represent the buyer. In that case, I've seen that. I would say, hey, somebody else represent the buyer's interest here. All right. And someone else had, uh, do you have to answer if you have a full price offer or not? No, you don't have to tell them what the offers are. Again, I believe, why would that be? That would not hurt. That would help your seller by saying, I have five offers, three of them are full. I would say, what I would say is, three of them are full price or higher. That's how I answered. I, if they all full price, I say full price or higher. That's how I answer. All, I, yes, I have a multiple offer. I have four offers, two of them are full price or higher. All right. But it helps your seller by telling a buyer that I have offers that are full price. That means, I'm probably going to bring an offer that's going to be above list price. Can you represent a buyer for the same property? I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right. Go to uh, 15. If the property is, no, I'm sorry, 14. 14. Seller will reveal defects and environmental hazards. What happened? Uh, obviously, the seller will disclose all known material defects and all uh, environmental hazards on a separate disclosure. We've all seen, we know sellers have to uh, fill out a seller's property disclosure statement. Even if, and here's a mistake I see with agents all the time, even if you are exempt from filling out a seller's property disclosure statement, 
but you know something about the property, you must still disclose it. If I'm wondering, there are 10 exemptions to the property, the seller's property disclosure law. If you fall into one of those exemptions, but you know the roof is leaking, and you let's say you're the executor of the estate, and you know the roof is leaking, you still must disclose that to a, to, to a potential buyer. You can't say I'm, ex, I'm, a, I'm exempt from the seller's disclosure law, so I don't have to disclose anything. If you know anything about that property, there are material defects, late defects that you know about, you still must disclose them, all right? Any questions? Uh, paragraph 15, if the property was built before 1978, we all know that it was built before 1978, you have to, the, you have to um, disclose whether or not you know anything about lead-based ha paint hazards in your property. Only if they're built before 1978. So if it was built in 1978, you don't have to disclose it. It's 77 and back down. So built before 1978, not including 1978. So the Residential Lead Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act, paragraph 15, says that any seller of property built before 1978 must give the buyer an EPA pamphlet titled Protect Your Family from Protect Your Family from Lead in Your House. You, you all know that. Most of the time the buyer will give it, but make sure that buyer gets his pamphlet. It's in Zoom. I mean not in Zoom, it's in um, zip form. Protect your family from lead in your home. Normally, the seller is the seller's responsibility to make sure the buyer gets it, or if the landlord's responsible to make sure the tenant gets it. Normally, the buyer's agent will give it to their client. But remember, it's the seller's responsibility to make sure the buyer gets that. All right. So if the buyer didn't get it, then and the agent didn't give it to the buyer, is actually your responsibility to make sure the buyer got that. All right. So it says the seller must also tell the buyer and the broker what the seller knows about lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards that are in or on the property being sold. You all know, make sure you all seen the residential lead-based paint hazard disclosure form. Make sure, I think that's in, the, is that in the, uh, I think that may be in. Uh, make sure you understand, you have to fill this out. You, and there are three of them. You see the first one is a seller's disclosure. The second part is a buyer's acknowledgement. The buyer acknowledges that they got this disclosure. And the third one was acknowledgement by the agent. The agent has acknowledged that they told their seller about this lead-based paint hazard disclosure form. So let's look at one. The first one is seller's disclosure. Seller has no knowledge of the presence of lead-based paint. Okay, that's the one they were initial. They don't know anything. If they do have knowledge, they have to initial they have knowledge. All right. The second part of that, seller's records or uh, reports. Seller has no records or reports. They were initial there if they have no records or reports. But if the seller has records or reports, they must provide those records and reports to the buyer. All right. And then the seller signs and dates. The second part is a buyer's acknowledgement. The buyer has received the pamphlet, protect your family from lead in your home. Buyer has to acknowledge that he or she received it. The next one is the buyer has received seller's disclosure of known lead-based paint. Um, so they did, I'm sorry, seller has reviewed the seller's disclosure of known lead-based paint hazards and they received any records if they did. Uh, and the other one would be buyer has received a 10-day opportunity to conduct a risk assessment. Keep in mind, anytime a buyer buys a property that was built before 1978, that buyer can conduct a risk assessment. Now the problem is you can't tell a buyer not to do it, but one of the things we know, if the property was built before 1978 and they conduct a risk assessment, they're going to find that base paint. They're probably going to find it, but you can't tell a buyer not to do it. Uh, but they have the right, that's a fed on the federal law, they have the right to conduct a 10 day, they have a right to conduct a risk Fred. assessment. They have 10 days to do that. And hold Fred. on, a the other one, hold on, let me just finish that one. And then the second one, they, they waive. This one says they waive the opportunity. If they don't want to conduct it, they will waive it. Yes, who was just saying, asking something? Deb, Deb Stanitz. Um, I received a um, lead paint addendum from a buyer's agent recently. And um, where it says that um, the buyer has received the pamphlet of the, um, for your protection, get the home, you know, Right. Whatever. Um, but, and they also said that the buyer has received the seller's disclosure of knowledge of lead-based paint. They 
they initialed both of those when my seller said they had no records of they should have both of them. They, they, they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have initialed both of them. Okay, so I that's what I told her, and she said, well, they've just disclosed that they have no knowledge and they have no records, and I'm just acknowledging that we've received that. And I said, mm, I don't think no, that's the she, way that's to be interpreted. No, she, read, she read that wrong. It says, receipt, which one was it? Broke, it's, buyer has reviewed seller's disclosure of known lead-based paint and or lead-based paint hazards and has reviewed receive the records and reports well did you receive any records or reports no no so it should be so she misread that tell her that yes yeah, she didn't receive my seller didn't give you the records or report so you shouldn't be finding it it's just she misread it that's all that's all thank you i just wanted to verify that i wasn't misinterpreting no it. you no no the buyer did i mean the other agent and the other part of this the third part so the first part is the seller's Disclosure. The second part is the buyer's acknowledgement, and the third part of this let residential lead based paint hazards disclosure form is the agent acknowledgement and certification. You have to sign this. It says the agent or licensee represents that the agent has informed seller of seller's obligations under the residential lead based paint hazard reduction act and is aware of the agent's responsibility to ensure compliance. So you have to sign initially saying, yes, I told my seller about this and, 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 and what they had to do. And then both the buyer, uh, buyer's agent and the seller's agent must sign this form. All right. All right, somebody says property. Uh, where can you find the recording of this meeting? Oh, well. Uh, I guess we'll ask that in a minute. I think they got out. We'll find that out in a minute. Uh, I think they, they mad at me to tell us that. And then what's the consequences if you do not disclose something you know? Well, the consequences are the buyer can sue you for damages. Or two times in my life, I've seen buyers go to court when the seller did not disclose latent defects and went to court and said, I want out of this deal. And the judges said, you out of the deal, undo this deal, seller, and you know you get the property back give the money back this deal's done so there are severe consequences if your seller does not disclose material defects things that you can see latent defects things that you can't see you need to tell sellers and i can't say this enough i tell my sellers on uh, seller's disclosures are the reason that that's the reason that we have more lawsuits in real estate because sellers don't sometimes tell the truth on sellers property disclosure statements you tell that seller take your time filling this out fill it out as completely as possible uh, fill it out as accurately as possible and if you're not sure whether to disclose something or not disclose it over disclosure is always better than under disclosure. I've never seen someone get sued for disclosing too little. I've only, I mean, for too, disclosing too much, but I have seen people get sued for disclosing too little. So make sure your seller understands the importance of that seller's disclosure statement and make sure you, the agent, can never help a seller fill that form out. You, that is not asking about your knowledge, is asking about the knowledge of the seller. You may say, Oh, those are lead pipes in your basement. The seller may think they're galvanized pipes. Is the, the answer is galvanized if that's what they put. It should be unknown if they don't know. But if they put galvanized, you should not correct them because if they believe that's what it is, they're telling the truth. So don't don't and don't go back over and say, I think that's wrong. Now you would go over and say, hey, you didn't fill this out. Or wait a minute, didn't you tell me the roof leaked um, last year? You didn't put that. Oh, yeah, but well, we fixed it. And you'll see, so I hear that a lot. Oh, we fixed it. So I didn't think I had to disclose it. No, if it leaked, you have to disclose it and you have to say, we repaired it. But don't, you still have to disclose it because if it leaked, I, the new buyer, may want to take a closer look at that roof because, and want to know why it roofed. I mean, why it leaked. Maybe I want a professional roofer to go up and make sure there are, there are going to be more issues with that roof. So you have to disclose everything that happened, even if it's been repaired. All right. I'll go to page. Uh, go further down on 15. It says any seller of a pre-1978 structure must also give the buyer any records and reports that the seller has or can get about lead-based paint 
or lead based paint hazards in or around the property being sold, the common areas, or other dwellings and multifamily housing. And last line, last line says the act does not require the seller to inspect for lead based hazards, lead based paint hazards, or to correct lead based paint hazards. The act does not apply to housing built before 1978. So the seller doesn't have to go and figure out if they're lead based paint. If they don't know, the answer is they don't know. Tell sellers they don't have to hire somebody to, to figure it out. If they don't know, the answer is on they don't know. Uh, you can't say to them, well, your property was built in 1950, so you know if you're lead-based paint. No, you don't know that. If the seller does not know, the seller, the answer is unknown. Don't just assume that they have lead-based paint because it was built before the 1978. Maybe they came in, they scraped all the paint off the walls and repainted. They removed all that base paint. Don't answer a question. Don't answer for the seller. These things are for the seller's knowledge, not your knowledge. All right. Any questions? Well, there's some questions up there. Uh, where can we find? What is the con? Can you void the sale if this is found out after settlement? Void the sale? No, you would have to. Once you own it, you wouldn't be able to void. You could. You can go to court. And, and ask a judge to un, undo the sale. Yes, and I told you two times in my life, not in my office, I know people who went to court to undo a sale when they discovered that there were some problems with the house that the seller knew about. One of them was the seller had a fire in the basement, put it out, but then decided to put a wall to, you know, there was all this fire damage. She put a wall in the basement and when they knock down that wall to finish the basement there's all this fire damage but the seller had a fire got money for the fire, never repaired it and and never disclosed it and so this person said i don't want this property and a judge agreed with it so yes there are consequences that's why sellers need to be honest all right uh buyers should too agents should too everybody should be honest 16 home warranties uh, you know, you obviously can get a home warranty. Seller can purchase a home warranty for, for a property. Uh, I think it's a good thing uh, for sellers to give home warranties to sell to buyers, but they don't have to. Some, uh, if you're a broker, just keep in mind some some uh, E and O co insurance companies will give you a. Uh, I think you get a with me with my company. If we offer, if all our sellers offer at least offer. Uh, what, no, I'm sorry. If our agents at least ask all sellers about uh, giving a home warranty to buyers. There is some type of, we get some type of reduction in the in the premium because it, because, well, I don't want to get further. Down. Number 17, recording of the property. Uh, seller understands that potential buyers viewing the property may engage in photographer, photography, videography. Uh, sellers should remove any items of a personal nature. We talked about before. Uh, sellers not wish to have photographed or recorded such as family photos, important or confidential paperwork. And that next paragraph we mentioned, tell your seller don't record someone. Any person who intentionally intercepts oral communications by electronic or other means without the consent of all parties is guilty of a felony under Pennsylvania law. Seller understands that recording or transmitting audio may result in violation of state or federal wiretapping law. So if the seller, the seller should not be listening in on the conversations of the people, of the buyers and uh, buyers who are coming in and out of the house. They record, that's one thing, but they cannot, they should not be listening on. They tell them don't listen. Let buyers walk through the house freely, uh, talk about the house freely without you all on, on them. And even if you have, well, this way. Wait a minute, another access record. All right. Uh, recovery fund, we all know about that. You, you just need to let sellers know, paragraph eight, 18, that if a seller, if an agent is uh, convicted of fraud, that seller, uh, and get, that seller gets a judgment in civil court, I mean, a, a civil judgment in court, that eight, that uh, client can then go, if that's, that seller, can, I'm sorry, let me back up. I, I just, if the, client gets a judgment against you because of fraud or deceit and that uh, client cannot um, collect on the judgment from you, then that seller, that client has a right to come to the real estate recovery fund and collect from there. Um, they have one year after the judgment to come to the real estate recovery fund and they can collect up to $20,000 per case. 
and the real estate recovery fund can pay out the $100,000 per licensee. You don't have to get all that information, but just uh, throwing it out. 19, notice a person's offering to sell or rent housing in Pennsylvania. Uh, nobody should do this. This should be a big one. You make sure sellers understand this. Federal and state laws make it illegal for a seller, a broker of anyone to use race, color, religion, se uh, or religious creed, sex, disability, familiar status, uh, age, national origin, uh, and uh, as reasons for refusing to sell, show, or rent properties, loan money, or set deposit amounts, or as reasons for any decision relating to the sale of their property. If you are working with a seller who will not sell or rent his or her property to someone in their protected class, you need to tell them they cannot do that because they're violating, they probably violate city law, state law, federal law, uh, depending on which class, then you should, if they don't understand that and they're not willing to undo, because some sellers don't know, they think, especially with children, I can tell you, I've had many, we do a lot of property management. I've had a lot of doctors, lawyers tell me not to put children on the second floor. And I've had to remind them that that's a violation of fair, the, uh, fair housing law. And I said, you ought to know that. But they, but they, but people think it's kind of okay when you are talking about discriminating against families with children. So, and children be anybody under 18 or women who are pregnant or families adopting children. Uh, so there are people who still discriminate against folks because of their race, their sexual orientation, their religion, all kinds of things. I have seen it. I have heard it. I, and I'm telling you, do not, and I've had clients who experienced it. Um, I can tell you, I even tell you, because it's the worst day I've had, had in this business. I, I feel like compelled to tell you. you know, probably about 15 years ago, maybe about 16 years, 17 now. But I'm showing a property. I'm not going to say what part of the city. Uh, beautiful sunny day. Go on the street. 50 people out. Chill, children play and everything. Have my young client, young African American male with his three year old daughter. He's like 25. We go into this house. He loves it. He says, Trent, I want it. We're in there about 30 minutes. Come out. He has a white Lexus. And someone had spray painted the N word from one end to the other on both sides of the car. Nobody's outside at this point. And, um, he kind of flipped out and it was a horrible, horrible scene, horrible day, my worst day in this business. Um, that stuff happens. Um, I still think about that. That was the worst day that I, it was just, it was the worst day I've ever had in real estate. Do people do that? Yeah. Um, I've seen it more, bl I've seen blatant and I've seen less blatant. Don't you be a part of that. If a client is telling you to discriminate against somebody based on anything, you need to get the heck out of there because you go to jail with them. You need to walk away if someone's saying, don't sell my fam my house to a black family, a white family, a Latino family, Asian family, a gay family, a Muslim, a Christian, a whatever it is, walk away. No commission is worth your freedom. All right. Any questions? Yeah, I, I had a quick question on that. Um, the, and this situation wasn't a client of mine, I feel like. I'm obligated to say that before I say anything, but um, so he was he was basically he was an investor and he was saying that he prefers to only rent to people who have either city jobs or SSI checks. Basically, saying that he wants somebody who has an income that's guaranteed. Like he doesn't want to rent to people with a normal or like a traditional job. He wants like city workers, um, you know, SSI. Like I said, was he wrong for that or no? I don't know if they would say you're wrong. Uh, I'm not sure if I would say, I mean, that you're not, there's no protected class. You're not, there's no protected class based on, now you can't, if he said, I won't present, I will not, I refuse to, I have a policy that I don't rent to people on SSI because a source of income is a protected class in Philadelphia. So that would be a violation of city law. But to say, I prefer, but take a look at it this way. If I say I prefer to work, uh, 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 um, sell to or rent to people in the city. Well, anybody can work for the city. You can be black, white, Latino, you can be Asian, you can be Muslim, you can be, so it's not like now if the city didn't hire women, then you would have a problem. Or if the city didn't hire Muslims, then you would have a problem. I don't know. It just seems crazy to me, but I don't know. There's definitely no protected class 
that he's yeah I, I don't I had yeah I don't, I don't there's no protected class that he's discriminating against because I mean I could say I'd rather only rent to people who wear blue on Wednesdays it seems stupid but could you do it you're not there's no protected class I, there's nobody if you're not protected if you I I, don't, I prefer to rent to Democrats I mean, is that a is religious? I mean, a political affiliation, a protected class? No. Uh, maybe you violate other laws. I don't know, but I think that sometimes people make bad business decisions, or business decisions don't make any sense. But it's not always a uh, lawsuit, or not always discrimination. I guess I don't know if that that answer your question. I'm trying to yeah, that, no, de definitely, because it, it kind of more put context. That, let me know that's like a gray area. In yeah, that well, I wouldn't say is anything. I don't think I, I'm not a lawyer, but I wouldn't think you're not violating it. You're not you're not discriminating against anybody based on a protected class. So I don't know. Maybe you just like you run it. I mean, I rather work on rent to people who live work for the city. I don't know. Again, I think that it's a little silly, but you know, but maybe it's OK. Um, all right, paragraph 20. Transfer transfer of this uh, transfer of this contract. Seller agrees a buyer may transfer this contract to another broker when the broker stops doing business or broker forms a new real estate business or the broker joins his business or another. So basically you're saying to the seller, if this brokerage ends and go and you know and or can or merges with another brokerage, we're taking your contract with us. Um, number 21, no other contract. Seller will not enter into another listing contract for the property identified in paragraph one with another broker that begins before the end date. Well, it can't. If you have an exclusive right to sell, you cannot have two exclusive right to sell contracts at a time. Exclusive right to sell means you hire one company to sell your property. So the seller understands that they can only hire one, have one exclusive right to sell contract at a time. Once this ends, the next day, they could have another exclusive right to sell. And as I said earlier, you could have, you could go today and hire someone to sell your property effective December 1 when the contract you have today ends Jan uh, November 30th. You can already have someone in place. That is not, that is perfectly okay. It just can't overlap. Uh, November 30th, this listen con exclusive right to sell listing contract expire November 1st. I have a new one with a different company, and that is perfectly okay. All right. And then I see a question up there. I'm related to this, but I wanted your thoughts. How do you answer the safety question? I find a lot of pushback when I recommend they look up crime stats. One lady asked me, would you let your daughter live here? That's a good question, and that's a good answer. And I, and you sell real estate, it's going to happen. Just know it's going to happen. I, I remember and I was selling a lot of it near, near University of Pennsylvania, lots of uh, Drexel students. At one point, I was selling a lot over there. I had a client who had about 20 investment properties. He wanted to get rid of all of them over near Drexel. And they would always ask that question, is it safe here? Uh, my child's going to go to Drexel or UPenn. Is this a safe neighborhood? Would you let your child live here? That is kind of, that's not normal. You're going to hear that. The answer is still the answer. Look up the crime statistics. I don't, I cannot tell you whether a neighborhood is safe what I recommend, I'll, you call the police district here or look or Google crime certificate, the tri crime stats for the area. But the moment you say, yes, this is a safe neighborhood. Yes, I will let my daughter live here. And this couple, this family buys a house for their daughter who's going to Drexel and then she gets mugged and they come back and they say, Jennifer, you told me that you would let your child live here. You told me this is a safe neighborhood. I'm going to sue you. I don't, again, keep liability away from you. Push it back to them. Tell them this is what I would recommend. I can get you the police district, the number to the police district. You can call them directly or you can Google crime statistics in this area. That's what you do. Don't ever tell a client, a seller, a potential buyer or seller about the safety or unsafe or non-safety of a neighborhood because what's safe for me may not be safe for you. Some people may be okay in a neighborhood where they hear one gunshot a night. Other people may not ever want to hear a gunshot. So you don't, if they have one mugging in a neighborhood, people say, I think it's not safe. 
Some people, okay, if there are a couple of uh, muggins a night, you is all subjective. Tell people to find that information out on their own because you don't want to be like, all right? Tell them, and if they ask, would you live here? Say, it's not about me. I tell them it's all about you. I'm focusing on you because you are the most important thing that's going on right now. Doesn't matter where I live. Is about you. I'm not getting myself into that. All right. That uh, number uh, 22, conflict of interest. If a conflict of interest, when it is a conflict of interest, when the broker or the licensee has a financial or personal interest in the property and or cannot put seller's interest before any other, if broker or any other broker's licensees or salespeople have a conflict of interest, broker will notify the seller in a timely manner. That is, if you decide you're going to buy this property or you going to, or, um, and I don't reckon, well, I'm not going to say that. Um, if you, if there are any conflicts, you need to disclose that to the seller. Remember, you have to put your seller's interest above your interest. Now, you know, if you're buying the property, you know, I don't recommend buying the property when you have it listed. I, I, I just don't, because that to me, that's an inherent conflict to me because I want the best deal for my seller but I should be getting the best deal for my seller, but I want the best deal for me if I'm buying it. So I, that clearly is a conflict because the seller may say, I'm not gonna sell it to you, but you should do that. I would stay away from that. I, I just don't think that's a good idea. They hired you to sell the property, sell it, get the best deal that you can for the seller. Remember you owe that seller those six fiduciary responsibilities. I always call it an old car. You owe a client an old car, O is for obedience. Uh, L is for loyalty, D is for disclosure, C is for confidentiality, A is for accounting, and C and R is for a reasonable degree of care. If I say that again, old car, so I tell people, I owe you an old car. You're a client. I don't owe a customer an old car. I owe a client an old car. Old car. O stands for obedience. I have to be obedient to you. I have to obey, and you, obey your instructions. You tell me not to show that property on Saturday, I won't show it. L is for loyalty. I have to put my interest above your interest. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I have to put your interest above my interest if I said that right. Uh, I can't do, I have to do what's in your best interest, not what's in my best interest. Loyalty, D, disclosure. I have to disclose whatever I know about this buyer, whatever I know about this property. If I know this buyer is willing to pay more money than he, uh, than what's listed in the contract because he told me and he's not my client, I need to disclose that to you. C, confidentiality. Whatever you tell me is confidential. I cannot share that with anybody outside of my office. Whatever, you and confidentiality, remember, lasts forever. And uh, A, accounting. I have to account for all the money that you give me. If I have to put this money in an escrow account, I can't co-mingle. I can't mix clients' money with my money. I can't uh, convert it. I can't spend it or misappropriate it. And an R for a reasonable degree of care. I'm supposed to always take care. I'm supposed to have a certain amount of professionalism, a certain amount of knowledge if I am representing you because people expect me to have more knowledge than the person at the Wawa if I am representing you in the sale of your property. Otherwise, maybe you should be at the Wawa and that person should be selling the property. All right. And uh, uh, entire contract, this paragraph 23, this contract is the entire agreement between the buyer and the seller and a verbal or written agreement that were made before are not a part of this contract. So if you all have some verbal agreement, you and the seller may have talked about maybe, um, you know, possibly giving seller, I don't know, whatever it is, don't, it's not a part of this. Make sure whatever you all agreed to, put it in this document, this document, the seller's disclosure. Don't think that verbal contracts, remember, if you're going to amend a written contract, you must amend it in writing. That's a parole evidence rule. If you're going to amend, you can't amend a written document verbally. You need to amend a written document in writing. So any changes to this document, put it in writing. Uh, put it in writing. If you're going to make any changes, there is that change. Uh, we have the form and zip forms, what's called a change in terms. If you're going to amend and make any changes to this, use that change in, change in terms form. All right. Um, uh, changes is uh, marketing of the property. Uh, where permitted, broker at the broker's option may use a for sale sign, lockbox, key in office, open house, and advertising, all media. And then the one thing I want to go down to D, um, 
multiple listing said the seller i don't know what seller would not want her property his or her property in a in an mls but if they don't it would say broke will not use mls if they want an mls which i'm sure 99.9 percent .9 of people do the usa broker will use a mls uh, a lot of sellers may not want a sign but I can't imagine a seller not wanting his or her property in the MLS because how do people know it's for sale? Um, and then publication of the paragraph 26, publication of the sales price. Sellers aware that MLS, newspaper, websites, and other media may publish the final sales price of the property. I'm sure if you've been in this business a while, sometimes sellers don't want people to know what this final sales price is. Well, you don't control that. What? I mean, the city is going to publish that. This is public information. Your house sold for 410000 that's public information. It is not a, it's not private information. You can't say, I don't want anybody to know what my property sold for. And copyright, page, uh, paragraph 27, just keep in mind there that anything that your seller gives to you is their information. I mean, if they give you pictures or they give you materials, it's their material. You have to, you may be to use it. You may put on MLS, but ultimately that information belongs to the seller. And it just says in consideration of broker's effort to market the seller's properties as stated in this contract, seller grants broker a non-exclusive worldwide license to use any potentially copyrightable materials which are related to the property and provided by seller to broker or broker's representative. The materials may include, but are not limited to photographs, images, video recordings, virtual tours, drawings, written descriptions, remarks, and price information related to the seller's property. And it says the license permits a broker to submit the material to one or more MLS services. And further down, it says seller also grants a broker the right to sub-license to others any of these rights granted to the broker, so maybe to an MLS or something. Uh, any questions? I think we're making good time, and I feel number uh number 28 fixtures and personal property make sure anything that's going to be included in the property you put it here anything that's going to be excluded put it here this is not the time make sure if they say the refrigerator is not not the uh the uh i'm trying to say the the chandelier is not going to be included make sure you put that and what's going to happen what happens if the chandelier is not going to be included, then you should say, what do we do? We're going to replace it. We're going to replace it with this. Get as specific as you possible. I say chandeliers because I've had that happen 20 times in my career where somebody says, I'm taking my antique chandelier down and I'm going to replace it. Well, what are you going to replace it with, seller? Tell me now. Go figure out what you're going to replace it with. So when the buyer comes in here, we can say to the buyer, this is what we're going to replace the chandelier with. This is the model, this is the color, this is the size, and have them agree to it so that nothing come, they don't come in on the pre-summer walkthrough and see a chandelier that looked like it came from the dollar store. That you And then they walk away and not close. Make sure everything, when I get to the settlement table, my belief is this is a celebration. I don't want any problems, I don't want any conflicts. Resolve all conflicts before you uh, before you get to the table, don't leave anything for chance. All right. So, um, excuse me. Yeah. I have a question. So, I'm having a listing coming up in spring, and the seller wants to leave all the furniture back. Where do I just write as seller will leave all furniture, or do I have to write every single thing down? I and where would I put it? it? I would tell the seller to take the furniture. I, I, I don't, maybe the buyer didn't want the furniture. You, I, first of all, I'm not taking somebody's furniture. I, I don't know if you have bed bugs or whatever. I'm not <laughs> taking somebody's old furniture. But think, think about this. I, I am, and, and again, if you do, just say that the furniture is included, all furniture. But buyers may not want your furniture. They may have their own furniture. I tell sellers, don't leave that. I, if that were my client, I would say, take the furniture. Have a garage sale, do something, give it away. I want the property vacant. I want the, and remember the contract mm -hmm. says you're going to deliver the keys to this house vacant, free of all the personal properties, free of debris. Now you can, obviously a buyer may want it, but I, I, I'm not selling. I would tell a seller to get rid of it. That's what I would tell a seller if they, if they, if they said it. But I am not going to, I am not going to, um, I'm not going to, I can, I'm not going to um, take furniture. Buyers should not be able to, I mean, sellers should just take the furniture. If they want to leave it, then fine. 
then tell them leave it. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I would not recommend it. Okay. Frank, can I say something? It's Carolyn. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, what I've been doing, um, because it was a time where the sellers left everything. I mean, you know, but then they said that added value. Like I tell them to write, use a separate piece of paper. First of all, I tell them my sellers the house has to be swept, broom clean. Period. All the stuff should be gone. But then if they do want to negotiate about furniture, I tell them I can't be a part of it to write a separate, you know, write up something separately saying like the buyer and seller agree that they're going to leave the green couch or whatever. I tell them it can't be a part of the agreement of sale. You know, it has to be totally separate between the buyer and seller. Is that okay to do? You know what, but here's the problem. Let me just say one quick story of why I don't do furniture. I tell people don't, I don't sell furniture. I sell real estate. I'll give you a right. example. And I, don't, right. I, was this, I was selling this house. It was a big house in East Oak Lane, seven mm -hmm. or eight bedrooms, three baths. Right. The seller buys, the seller saw the buyer at the Whole Foods in Jenkintown. She sells her, her dining room furniture, beautiful dining room furniture. She paid 5000 for it. She's selling for 1500 well, yeah. I come in that morning and I see the dining room furniture there. I'm like, well, why is the dining room furniture here? She's, oh, I'm selling it to the buyer. I said, well, I wish you, well, when did this happen? Oh, I saw the Wawa. So I was a little upset because said, I've always told my clients don't have communication with the buyer. Sellers and buyers who never talk on their own. Well, yeah. one thing I remember when I was doing the listing contract, I was sitting at the table, there was a big scratch on this beautiful dining room table. And I said to her, where, what happened to this scratch? Because this table's so nice. She said, my grandson has something. He was playing and he scratched the table. I remember that. Well, the morning of the settlement, the buyers come through after I leave and they say, the buyer says, what is this scratch? And she said, it was there when you, when you looked at it. She said, no, it wasn't. And she says, because you have this big scratch on the table, I am not going to buy this house. And she left. And that's now, keep in mind, real estate, the, the personal property has nothing to do with the real estate. But right. I know that scratch was there because I sat in front of it. The buyer says, you're trying to get over on me. And they wouldn't, they would not close. We didn't close that deal to one day later because I had to, what I ended up doing, I told this seller, you will give this dining room furniture to this woman and we're going to close this deal. You, she was moving to out of state. And she, I'm like, listen, first of all, you go and make a deal to sell real estate. I mean, personal, personal property. When I said, don't do that. Now you see what happened. And she agreed. I said, what we're going to do is say, take the dining room furniture. And that's how we're able to close. And this was like a $650,000 property. This seller, this buyer was not going to budge because she was angry about a scratch that was already there. My point is, if the furniture is not there, there can't be a conflict. Leave, don't sell furniture. Go if they I tell people I sell real estate. I don't sell shoes, I don't sell scepter passes. I don't if I you want furniture, go to Raymore and Flatting. I don't sell furniture. My license says I sell real estate, and that's what I do. If somebody wants to sell furniture, I say have a garage sale. I'm not getting involved and I'm not letting my sellers sell furniture. If they ask Trent, does a buyer want to buy this? I say, I don't know but we're not going to, why don't you sell it to your neighbors, sell it to your coworkers, put it on Google. I mean, put it on wherever, but I want this house broom swept clean. If you want to leave the seller, buy or something, the buyer said, Hey, I really like that diner. I'm saying, Hey, you're, you're first time on buyer. We'll leave this for you, but I'm not selling anything. Yeah. Now, I, okay. Yeah. I don't mean selling. I do mean like when they want to leave. Give it away. You mean, and oh, and I'm sorry, Callan, I wouldn't respond to that. I agree with oh. you. Man. If they're going to give it, write down. But again, I wouldn't even do that. I'm telling you. I don't write it. I let them write it. I want, what'd you say? I said, I, I don't want to be a part of it. I'm telling them that I can't, we, the agents can't be a part of this. Right. I don't want, I'm not leave. I'm not dealing with furniture. I'm right. not doing it. Exactly. Okay. All I'm right. not doing it. All right. Number, where are we? Included. Okay. Uh, fixtures and personal property. What's included in the sale? Uh, items permanently installed in the property, obviously, and, uh, including chandeliers, ceiling fans. Remember, anything that is attached to the property is real estate. When I come into a property and I see a ceiling fan, or if I see a chandelier, it must be there when I come back to buy the property. She, ceiling fans, uh, chandeliers are attached to the property. They are real estate. They are not personal property. 
Make sure sellers understand once that prop that property goes on the contract, seller cannot remove the chandeliers or the ceiling fans. I say those two because that seems to be what many of them will do. Tell them everything that's in this house right now that's attached to this property must be here when that buyer comes back to do a pre settlement walkthrough. All right. Trent, I usually advise my sellers, if you're going to take that chandelier, replace it now before we That's list. Exactly what I tell them. Absolutely, Deb. That's exactly what I tell them. If you want to take the chandelier, my advice is remove it now before we put it on market. But the only thing is, sometimes sellers will say, oh, no, I want my chandelier here and enjoy it for my... So then I say, if that's the case, I say, tell me exactly what you're going to replace it with. Go find it. And then I'm going to put an MLS. I'm going to draw up an addendum that says the seller will replace the chandelier in the living room with X. And you're going to know exactly what it is. The model number, where it's being purchased, what the length. So you cannot say when you come back and look through the pre-summer walkthrough and you see that new chandelier, you agree to that. There, so if that, that the, but the worst, the best case scenario is to ask that seller to remove it before you even show the property. That is absolutely what I'd rather do. Uh, what is it? Seller <laughs> opportunity in the home before settlement, like wipe things down, vacuum. Seller has, to, yeah, seller should clean it, but the seller, the agreement sale says that the property must be left broom swept clean. Broom swept clean. Doesn't say they have to wipe things down, but I, you know, I think you ought to, but you can't leave any personal items. It doesn't say it has to be clean, it said it has to be broom swept clean. So uh, you should take a broom and sweep. You shouldn't have garbage on the floor, but you don't have to go down and, I, I, I mean, I always tell my sellers to clean the place, all right? Clean it so that somebody is gonna move in here. You would want it clean. If you moved in there, please clean it. I would just ask the seller to do that. But the agreement sale just says it needs to be broom swept clean, free of all debris and personal items. And excuse me, excuse me. Yes. What, uh, how would you respond if a uh, seller requests that you not place any of your signs on their property? You don't do it. Simple as that. You don't do it. I mean, there are a lot of sellers for a host of reasons that don't want a seller, I mean, a sign in front of their house. And I remember once where I had a seller who was been, who was in an abusive relationship and she was trying to get away from a boyfriend and she was selling her property. She's going to move to Atlanta. And she told me, do not put any signs on my house. I need this sold fast because I'm going to get out of town because I don't want this man to know where I am. So for whatever reasons, people don't want, some people think that people may break in it. I see a lot, I, I find a lot of my older clients, they don't want signs because they live there. They may live alone. They're afraid that people are going to think that no one's there, try to break in. So for a host of reasons, people don't want signs. Uh, but if they say no sign, you don't put a sign. I love signs. I think signs are probably the best way to sell a house next to MLS. People drive. I've had so many times when sellers, buyers saw a sign and bought a house when they weren't looking. They said, oh my God, I love that block. I've always wanted to live on that block. And they, they buy a house, but they weren't in the market. So signs actually, signs are, I think probably 15%, 20% of houses still sell just from the signs. Signs are good. I love signs. And signs are good for leads too. Right, but if they tell you don't put a sign, you have to obey. Remember, obedience. You have to obey the instructions of your client. No sign, obey the instructions. All right. Number, go to um, C. Uh, 28C. It says the following items are not owned by the seller and may be subject to a lease or other financing agreement, like the solar panels, windmills, water treatment systems, anything that's not owned by the seller may be leased. Just write that down so the buyer don't think they own that. You say, hey, uh, this is leased. You can continue to lease. You can take over the lease, but I don't own these things. And what's excluded? This is what you put that's excluded. That chandelier is excluded. Or the, uh, you wouldn't have to put refrigerators include, excluded because refrigerator is personal property. But if a person thinks the refrigerator is included, just put I would put refrigerator because some agents don't know that a refrigerator is personal property. Put ex refrigerators excluded. Uh, just put it there again. Do I have to know? 
but I want to make sure there are no issues. I don't want the, sell the buyer to walk into the house on the day of settlement and the refrigerator is gone. And they said, well, where's the refrigerator? No, we thought the refrigerator is included. I don't, listen, again, I can, can't say this minute. My, when I get to the table, I don't want issues. Make sure all issues are resolved before. If you think this may be an issue, put it down. Refrigerator is not included. Refer make it clear. If it's if if it's not if it's if the buyer may think is included, you know you don't want them to think it may. Spell it out is not included or it is included. All right. Um, and taxes and special assessments at settlement, seller will pay the transfer tax one half unless they agree otherwise. You have to put the yearly taxes, what the, the assessment is, whether is there's a tax abatement, how many years are left, um, the condo fees, the COA. That's the Condo Owners Association, HOA, the Homeowners Association. What's the name of that? What's the, if they're, what the assessments are? Because if you're selling a condo, that's really important. What are the, what's the monthly condo fees? Because I do need to know that. Uh, if the condo fees are $800 a month, I'm like, oh my God, I can't afford that. What are, is there, a, is there a, a, an assessment fee? They may have a capital improvement fee that you pay in, as a, in addition to your condo fee. Whatever the fees are, make sure you put them down and, and put those in MLS. I think I would put that stuff in MLS. Uh, you don't want any surprises. And obviously, when the seller orders the condo docs, uh, the resale certificate is going to have all of those all those financials in there. Um, and are the HOA fees or the COA fees paid quarterly, monthly, yearly? Make sure you don't make that mistake and say the condo fees are $150 a year when it's actually $150 a month. All right. I've seen people make that mistake when I've sold some condos. They put the they put eight hundred dollars for it was eight hundred dollars quarterly. They put eight hundred dollars for a year. Well, that's a big difference. That's a twenty four hundred a year as opposed to eight hundred dollars a year. Make sure again, you the agent, if you're the buyer, make sure that these numbers are right. Ask the agent. Hey, are you sure that it's eight hundred dollars a month? Or call the condo association. Tell them, hey, I'm a buyer's agent. I want to make sure what are the condo fees on the two bedrooms in this building. They say it's $800 a month. I mean, make sure you're representing the buyer, represent your client to the best of your ability. Uh, title and possession. Seller will give possession of the property to a buyer at settlement, or if it's a date beyond settlement, which I would never do, you would write that date. I would never have a buyer move into a property before they buy it, because if they don't pay the rent or the settlement doesn't go through, you got a problem. I would. I know people do it. I just would never ever do that. If you you can move in that property on the day of settlement, I'm not doing leases. I, I'm I'm gonna. You just go find an apartment or hotel until you go to settlement. Question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So this the condo um, was actually the furniture place. Um, so let's just say the condo fee is five fifty monthly, but she told me is there's usage as gas. That's paid separately where would i fill that in at uh you'll find on the and mls you'll you'll find that on mls where you can put that where that oh. you or you would just say that the gas is not included that because it's going to ask you when you do when you go to mls and you put in the condo uh it's going to say what's included in the condo fee you will say water electric whatever and you would say you wouldn't have to say you may just put add in the gas is not included you know but you it'll be boxes where you would check what it what is included all right you'll see that when you you put it in the ml when you put it in mls all right thank you you're welcome and then c seller has if they have a mortgage get the mortgage company one of the things that i think you ought to do if there's a mortgage ask the seller for the last payment the last um statement because you want to know what that seller owes. Now, it may not be correct. It may be that they are behind, but you want to see if they're current on the taxes, if the taxes are included on the mortgage. But if their mortgage says they owe 110,000, because a lot of times sellers don't know uh, what the uh, what is uh, what they owe. They may tell you, I think I owe 110. We get a payoff that's 175. Well, if your payoff is 175 and you thought it was 110 and was selling the property for 185, you got a problem. So make sure you know what of what that seller owes. Ask them to give you a copy of that statement, of that last bank statement. 
and also ask them, do you have any other loans? Because they don't think mortgages, when they got, when they got a kitchen done and they got a home improvement loan or home equity loan, they don't think that's a mortgage loan. So you have to ask, do you have any other thing? Even before title, title's not been done. I don't want to put a property on the market that we can't sell because the, oh, the seller owes too much. Ask, did you pay, do you owe, do you pay anything else? Do you have any other, anything else that is a tap that you use this house as collateral where you pay monthly, like windows or kitchen, anything? They say, oh yeah, I did get a new kitchen and I pay $150. Well, that's a loan. That's a mortgage loan. Anytime you use a house as collateral is a, is a, is a loan, is a mortgage loan, and ask for that document too, because you want to make sure that you're not going to list a property too low, and now you get you find out that the seller owes more than what, what the property's worth, and you can't sell it, or you have to sell it short. Um, and then the seller has a first mortgage, a second mortgage, and the last one says seller authorized the broker to receive mortgage payoffs and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, the seller has judgments. If they have judgments, if they have passed taxes you they might know but they know if their taxes are not paid especially if they're in the mortgage you know they probably if they included the mortgage then they've been paid if the mortgage has been paid but if they if not including the mortgage make sure their taxes are current do they have any federal tax liens or state tax liens or any municipal assessments or any condo fees past condo fees you're selling a condo and they haven't paid condo fees in six months uh you know you want to know this because of course we need to make sure that the seller has enough to sell their, that that with the mortgages and all the fees and attorney's fees and commissions and all. We want to make sure there's enough money for this seller to sell this property. Uh, then you need to ask if they have any child support because you, you're going to have to pay that. E, if seller has been obligated to pay child support under an order on record in any Pennsylvania county, list of county, and a domestic relations number or docket number. 31 buyer financing what will your buyer take i mean your seller take do they only want cash will they take uh fha finance will they take va will they take conventional what it is what will they take uh and that's when you have to put that in mls so they're not taking va or they're not taking uh or they're not taking um uh fha you need to and and they per and they can do that there's nothing wrong. A seller may say, I'm not taking VA financing or FHA. I only want conventional because I know that I can close sooner with conventional. I know that a, a buyer generally has to have better credit with conventional. I know a buyer can buy property as is with conventional. So I'm not taking FHA. I know FHA is going to have some, they're going to do an appraisal. They're going to come back and possibly ask me to do repairs. VA may take longer. They're going to ask me to do repairs. I don't want in this market, I don't want conventional. I don't want a conventional financing. That is perfectly okay for that seller to do. All right. Frank, I got a quick question. Quick question. Yes. I have yes. a seller right now and she was in a situation with a, a guy or something like that. Somehow or another, this jut a lien was attached to her house for $23,000. So in order to have it cured at settlement, title wants a payoff letter. So I told her, I said, listen, I need a payoff letter for the amount and so we can ensure that the correct person is paid off. She's like, I have no idea who placed this lien on your house, on my house. I said, that's crazy, but I need you to figure out who put the lien on your house and the exact amount. I need a payoff letter. I directed her to the city of Philadelphia, the, uh, the recorder's office of deeds, because I'm thinking that's her first step. What do you think? Well, is there a title? I would look at the title. Title's gonna, you're gonna figure out who the lien is. Who okay. Is the when you get the title search back. Okay. Who the title, who, who placed the lien. So okay, yeah, cause. Yeah, wait till the title comes in. Okay, cool. Yeah, and that would be it. Because sometimes, sometimes they really don't know. Sometimes they don't, they don't remember it until you say, oh. Right. Remember when you did, oh yeah, I do. I didn't know they placed a lien against my property. So yeah. the title, and if they don't, and the title company should be able to help you with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Number uh, and then the uh, the uh, 32 special instructions. If you make any changes, as any special conditions or conditions or additional terms in this contract must comply with the Pennsylvania Plain Language Consumer Contract Act, which just means that if you make any uh, additions or you make any addendums to this, it has to be in easy to read. I mean, easy to read, or me easy to read and understand language because the, all our documents are subject to that plain what they call again the. Pennsylvania Plain Language Consumer Construct 
contract act, which means that documents must be easy to read. You, they shouldn't be complex, written in all this legalese or technical stuff. It is seller and buyer agree to do X, not they hereby, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just you make it make it easy to read that. So it's subject, the only ones that's not subject to the, the plain language act would be deeds and mortgages and, and titles. They can use that technical language and, and legalese, but not all of the documents that we use normally. All right, and 33 special clauses, if you had any special clauses, uh, you know, like if it was a short sale, you would, you would, uh, you would check that and include that. Uh, down further, it says seller has read the consumer notice. Make sure the seller has a consumer notice. Uh, did I tell you the documents I want you to have? Let me say that in a minute. Seller has read the, has received the seller's property disclosure. They should fill that out. And the seller has received that lead-based paint hazard form that we talked about. And then the seller has read the entire contract before signing. And the seller must, the seller has read the entire contract before signing. Seller gives permission to the broker to send information, blah, blah, blah. Let's go out to, I think that's it. The broker has to sign. And um, I mean, the, the company name and you sign on behalf of the broker. Um, and that is it. Boy, I think we did, we went to any questions. <laughs> this is the first time I did this, by the way. So how did it go? Never oh, did you it. did excellent. It was Nobody awesome. Nobody could tell you did excellent. As usual. Good. As usual, very thorough. Great job, I can't Trent. wait until as, the as in person classes. Thank you, Trent. Right. I have a really important. Good I have job. a question for you. Um, I'm looking to get an ottoman, an ottoman for my uh, living room set. Um, do you sell furniture? <laughs> yes. Uh, That's the main takeaway. Trent doesn't sell furniture. <laughs> I know, Matt, I sell real estate. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you, Trent. Yeah, thanks, Trent. Thank you, Trent. Yeah, thanks, Trent. For a long time. You've been in this business. How was that, Deb? It was very good. Helpful information. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Have a great so. day. Hey, everyone. Right, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for tuning day. in. Thanks so Have a much, great Trent. Weekend. Thanks, Matt. Good job, Trent. Good job. Good job. Enjoy your holidays. Bye. Be safe. Happy holidays. Yeah, happy right. Thanksgiving. Bye, I don't know. I don't know.